Well, it's Joe McGee. Welcome to our podcast. Make sure that you subscribe and please share the podcast with your friends. That is the number one way you can help us reach people with God's love and healing. We love you guys. Hope you enjoy the podcast. Hey everybody, it's Joe McGee. Welcome to the Heroes of Faith. We're taking time going through about King Saul today. And one of the great stories where God picks a nobody uh, that, that doesn't seem to want to do anything necessarily important. God picks him to be the king of the greatest nation on the face of the planet because God's a show off. You know, I always tell people, uh, it's not the most talented, the most noble, the most mighty. God uses uh, weak things to confound the strong, you know, the small things to confound the large things. God loves to show off. So I tell people, it's not who's the biggest or the bravest. And we also used to always make jokes. I've been to all my high school reunions for, you know, 50 years. And so uh, you notice those are voted most likely, you know, never did. You know, um, those who voted you know, most handsome didn't turn out so good, you know. And it's just odd because I remember used to we go to our reunions, we'd have to wear pictures of us when we were seniors in high school so people could recognize us because we had changed so much. Man lost our hair on our head, put on a few extra pounds. It's like we didn't look the same because life changes, you know. So what we're trying to do is trying to grow up and mature. So here we got a story today in First Samuel chapter 10. You know, Israel had rejected, you know, uh, their prophet, you know, they'd always been there by prophets. And so all of a sudden, uh, they, they reject Samuel. We don't want you anymore. We don't want a prophet. So Samuel was the last great prophet in the Bible that had 15 of them. They were all great. He's the last one. And so they got upset because what happened was Samuel was a great prophet, anointed, uh, could hear the voice of God, but he was a horrible father. He was a no good father, but he got two sons that are just nasty and mean and lie and steal and are thieves. Uh, Eli the priest, you know, uh, uh, you know, great story in the Bible had two sons. So Eli's the great priest, you know, he, he hears from God, he does the big sacrifice for the people of Israel, but he had two sons that were just nasty, ratty sons. Matter of fact, God warned him about it, said, if you don't get control of your sons, there'll never be another male child in your house that will serve God. And that's why his two sons got killed in battle. Uh, Eli fell backwards off a stool, broke his neck, and died. God said, listen, I won't let this go on. I will not allow this to continue to happen. So God's looking, you know. Parenting is a huge issue to God. Uh, that's why God, the first the first couple in the Bible, you had in Genesis, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it. I mean, he, this, it's important. Parenting is critical to God. We're always one generation away from losing everything. That's why we're supposed to teach uh, those that are weaned from their mothers. Train up a child in the way it should go. The Bible is packed from Genesis to Revelation about teaching and training the next generation. God is always concerned about the next generation. So in every major story of the Bible, it's going to come up. Uh, I taught uh, at a, a, a class for years, for 10 years, I taught a class on biblical, called Biblical Worldview. What the Bible says, you know, we've got to find out what the Bible says, you know. I used to tell people, and I make jokes about it even in our seminars now. I said, you know, volume two's not coming out. God's hanging with volume one. And so we have the story of the first king, the very first king, uh, King Saul. And so we've already covered the story about how he got anointed uh, to be king. He wasn't looking for it. Matter of fact, he, was, he wasn't really a great man of character, but God picked him. And so Sammy pointed him out, and you're it, and, and, uh, now he knows he's been anointed to be king. He's not sure what to do about it. So in First Samuel chapter 10, we start to get some detail about what's going on. So it says, Samuel sent messengers throughout the land to call all the Israelites to Mizpah, a place where God had helped them defeat the Philistines. So everybody knew this is a special place. Something special is going on. So when the people came, Samuel reminded them of the many times God had blessed them, that God had helped them out of their troubles. He spoke of the time that God led their grandfathers out of slavery in Egypt. Now, Sammy said, you want a king to rule over you instead of letting God be your ruler and king. You dishonor God and ask him for a king today, but God will give you what you want. Today he will choose a king for you. Then the twelve tribes came before the Lord. You know, first the strong tribes passed by, but God did not choose one of them. From the very smallest tribe, God chose a family, the family of Kish, and God let it be known that he had chosen Kish's son Saul to be king. 
You think it's going to be something special? Well, I'm going to the smallest tribe. I'm going to pick a family you probably don't even know about, and I'm picking the son of somebody you probably don't even know about. So everybody wanted to see the man that God had chosen. But Saul could not be found. He had hidden from the crowd. And the Lord told Samuel, Look, he hid himself in the baggage. And the people were so eager to see their king that they ran and they found him. When Saul stood up before the people, he was head and shoulders above every man in the crowd. And he was a handsome fellow. Samuel said, See, the man God has chosen. None is like him. And the people shouted, God save the king. Well, you wonder where that comes from? It comes from the Bible. First time I said, First Samuel. What before? What'd you first hear? God save the king. Wasn't in England. It was in the Bible, and they said that about Saul. Then Samuel told the people the kind of kingdom that they should have. Samuel knew the people would forget his words, so he wrote it in a book, all the words that he had told the people. Finally, Samuel dismissed the people, and every man returned to his home. Saul, too, went back to his home at Gibeah, went with him a company of men who loved God and their new king. Not all the people approved of the man that God had chosen. They wanted to choose one of their own rulers from their own tribe. They insulted Saul by saying, How can this man save us? Because they hated him. They didn't want they didn't want him to they didn't want to bring him presents, they didn't want to honor him, they didn't want to vote for him. Nothing has changed in thousands of years. I don't care who runs for Congress, who runs for president, who runs for Senate, half are gonna be thrilled, half are gonna hate his guts. Nothing's changed. Welcome to planet Earth. Saul pretended not to notice the angry looks and the rude actions. He went quickly about his work and paid no attention to them. Chapter 11. Soon after God had chosen Saul to be king, great trouble came to the Israelites who lived at Jabesh. The Ammonites, a fierce desert people, besieged their city. The men of Jabesh knew they could not drive the Ammonites away. It would be better not to have them as rule over us, uh, or be better to have them rule over us than for us to fight them and be killed, the men thought. Hey, let's be their slave. At least we'll be alive. I mean, when things get tough, man, people, they think of the dumbest stuff to do. So they sent messengers to tell Nash, the king of the Ammonites, make peace with us and we will serve you. King Nash said, we will make peace with you on one condition. If you will let us come among you and put out each person's right eye, we will make peace. Then all of us will know that uh, you have disgraced them. What a terrible condition for peace. Finally, the elders of the city told us, Give us seven days to send messages throughout, the, throughout Israel asking for help. If dumb come to help us, we will do what you say. Yes, we are so wimpy. We are so sorry. We are so worthless. Yes, we'll let you put out one of our eyes and be your slave for the rest of our life. Guys, do you understand? Nothing's changed. There's always some, half the people want to fight, half don't want to fight. Half want to make peace, half don't need any peace. It, it, there's nothing, nothing's ever changed. So it says, swift messenger was sent across the Jordan River to Gibeah, the city where Saul lived. When the people heard the bad news, everybody started to cry. Saul heard the wails of his neighbors. We turned from the field to see what was wrong. And they told him the bad news from Jabesh. Up to this time, Saul had quickly gone about his own work, even though he'd been, uh, he had been anointed as king. Now the Spirit of the Lord stirred within him. He's got to help the people. So he sent messages to all the Israelites that they would be punished severely if they did not come to help them in at Jabesh. Everywhere the soldiers of Israel left their homes and hurried to Saul. Soon he had a large army. Together they marched across the hills of Benjamin to the Jordan River. Here they waded through the water, and they climbed the bank on the other side. They sent messengers to the men of Jabesh, saying, By the time the sun is hot tomorrow, you will be lying. There will be there. Uh, we will be there to help you. We're coming. Don't give up. How glad and thankful the men of Jabesh were. No longer were they afraid of their enemies. They told the Ammonites, Tomorrow, you do us what you think is best. The next day, the soldiers of Israel arrived. Saul had divided his men into three companies to fight against the cruel Ammonites. The enemy was so scattered, there were not even two soldiers together in any place. The men of Jabesh were saved from much suffering. Nash did not return to fight again. The Israelites were proud of their king. 
when they saw how brave he was, and they praised him. Now they remembered the men who had insulted Saul. Where are those no good for nothing men who did not want Saul to be a king? Let's get of them right now. But Saul would not permit it. He said, No, no, no man, no man's going to be killed today. For the Lord has saved us from our enemies. So, in chapter 11, after the victory over the Ammonites, the men of Israel crossed the Jordan River. They stopped at Gilgal, the place where the fathers had camped when they came to Canaan. Here the Israelites sacrificed to the Lord, and all the people had a great party. At the time Saul announced he would no longer, Samuel said, I will no longer be your judge, but I will continue to live among you and tell you God's words. While the people rejoiced with a new king, Samuel looked on sadly. How disappointed he was that the people had refused to let God rule over them any longer. Samuel left and had to warn, uh, warn them once more. Now, Samuel said, your king walks before you. I am old and I'm gray. I've lived among you since I was a child. You know all about me. Tell me, have I ever judged you wrongly? No, the people shouted. Have I taken anything that did not belong to me or accepted a bribe? No, they said. Then Samuel said, The Lord is a witness to this truth. And all the people answered, He is witness. And Samuel reminded the people of the many ways God had cared for them. God had delivered them from the cruel enemies many times. But often the people turned away from God and they served idols. Then when trouble came again, the people would cry to the Lord. We have sinned. We have turned away from you. We have served idols. Now deliver us from our enemies and we will serve you. Samuel told the people, when your enemies were all around you, God protected you. Now you want a man to be your king instead of God. Because you insisted, the Lord has given you a king. If you and your king serve the Lord and obey his commandments, it will be well with you. But if you do not, God cannot help you. Because the people forgot God so easy, Samuel wanted to remind them of God's great power. He told them, the Lord will send a great thunder and rain, and though you will remember the wrong you have done. And so as the sky grew dark with heavy clouds, the thunder roared so loudly that the men were afraid. The rain was so heavy in fear, the people cried to Samuel, Pray for us. We have sinned against God. We've, we've only added to our wrongdoing when we asked for a king. So Samuel comforted the people. Do not be afraid. You've done wrong in the past. Now follow the Lord and serve him with all your heart, and the Lord will not forsake you. And I will pray for you, and I will teach you what's good and what's right. But you must serve the Lord always and remember the great things he has done for you. As the people returned to their homes, they thought about Samuel's words. I'll tell you just a minute. Here's what's going on. It's over and over and over. Sam is telling them, you need to remember God. You need to remember God. You need to remember God. You know, in Revelation 2, 4, it talks about how uh, the church at Ephesus uh, had done so many good things. God was so proud of them. Of the seven churches that it addresses in the book of Revelation, Ephesus was bragged on the most. And so God's talking to him said, God is so uh, pleased with what you've done. You've been so faithful, so loyal, and you've served so long. You've been a blessed everybody around you. But God has something against you. And they said, what? I thought God loved us. He does love you, but God has something against you. What? And here's what he said. You have left your first love. Now, this is the church, Ephesus, who's bragged on the most, who had the most compliments, but God said, I got a problem with you. You have left your first love. The same thing with all Christians I've ever known in my whole life. You've got to work to stay close to God. You've got to go boldly to the throne of grace, get mercy up in time of need. You've got to run to God, not away from God. And so the sin nation wants to hide. The sin nation wants to draw back because you know you've done wrong. You know you feel that guilt. And so you try to run. But God warned us. He said, no, you need to run boldly to the throne of grace to get mercy and help in time. Who needs mercy? People that have sinned on purpose. It'd be like somebody asked, did you sin? Uh-huh. How's it working out for you? Not too good. God said, when you sin, run to him, not away from him. But my whole life in church, you realize, you know, people that dropped out of church, whatever, well, they've sinned. They're running from God. And so he got, he got Israel, and they realized something. 
We, we don't want God. We want a human like other people have. God said, well, I'll give me one. So he's, Samuel warns him again and again. This will not be good. This is not what God wanted. This is what you wanted. God will do what you want. God will do what you want. It's not what God wants, but God will do what you want. And people, it's from Genesis to Revelation. I told people, God lets you do what you want. I don't, I don't have to go to church. No, you don't. You know, you don't have to go to hell, but you can if you want to. You know, it's your choice. God said, I set before you life, death, blessing, cursing. You choose. You get to choose. And so here it is. The, the, they've had prophets their whole life. They finally want a king. And the prophet tells the last great prophet, says, okay, I'm going to give you one. But it's not going to go good. And he's going to take your kids for the army, take your daughters to be his servants. He's going to tax the hand. There's never, there never was a tax. The first tax mentioned in the Bible was when Israel became, got a king. You got a king's got to have a place to live, a chair to drive, some food to eat, and some people to serve him. So now we're going to have to tax you. So 10% of your income you just lost because you got yourself a king. So I hope it's worth it to you. And so the last speech that, that Samuel give, gives them is a reminder. You know, you had it good, but nope. You wanted a king. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you money. Cost you time, cost you your crops, it's gonna cost you kids, it's gonna cost you. You wanted it, God gotta give it to you. So I tell people, you, you don't want what you want, you want what God wants. So you you want to pray those prayers, those 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 King James prayers, Lord, not my will, thy will be done. You know, Jesus, Father, that's what Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, not my will, thy will be done. Jesus prayed that prayer. Father, not my will, thy will be done. Your will be done, not my will. My will is a mess. I don't want what I want. I want what you want. So you got to pray that over your kids, over your marriage, over your business, over your church, over your family, over your city, over your state, over your nation. Father, your kingdom come. Your will be done. Not our will. Your will be done. Father, teach us to fear you, for the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs says. How do you get wisdom? You need to fear God. How do you fear God? You've got to ask him to teach you. Father, teach me and my family to fear you, for the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. With that wisdom, Proverbs 3.16, comes long life, riches, and honor. How do you get long life, riches, and honor? You need to fear God. What does that start with? Somebody's got to ask him. So, Lord, today, we close this great program and just say, Father, we ask you in Jesus' name, teach us and our family, teach us and our, our spouses, teach us and our family to fear you. For the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And with that wisdom, according to your word, comes long life, riches, and honor. We're not going to chase long life. We're not going to chase riches. We're, gonna ch- we're not going to chase honor. We're going to chase you. And it comes as a package deal. So, Father, thank you for teaching us to fear you. In Jesus' name, amen. Be sure to join us Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to hear more of what God can do in your life. It's got a great future for you and your family. We're here to help you get there. Please make sure you visit Joe McGee Ministries on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. There you find all of our Friday funny videos and other encouraging resources for you and your family. While you're at it, be sure to visit JoeMcGee.com. We have all sorts of materials, books, DVDs, you name it, all there to help you, your marriage, and your family succeed.